Hello, in this video, I'll be discussing some specialized maneuvers within the cardiovascular exam, which you would not need to perform on most patients, but which are useful in specific situations. Specifically, I'll be discussing orthostatic hypotension, pulsus paradoxus, and a few quick findings seen in either volume depletion or heart failure. Assisting today as our patient is Radhika. The first special maneuver I'll discuss is orthostatic hypotension which is the observation of a drop in blood pressure upon standing. Normally, when a person moves from supine to sitting or sitting to standing, there is a significant pooling of venous blood in the veins of the legs. Despite this drop in preload to the heart, the blood pressure remains stable in healthy individuals due to compensatory increases in heart rate, contractility, and systemic vascular resistance. However, if those compensatory responses are impaired, blood pressure will fall upon standing, which can result in lightheadedness. Orthostatic hypotension is a significant cause of syncope, that is, passing out, particularly in the elderly. To detect this phenomenon, we check what is called orthostatic vital signs, meaning we measure the pulse and blood pressure with the patient in different positions. There are several described variations, but the one I recommend is to first measure the pulse and blood pressure with the patient supine after they've been in that position for at least five minutes. Then they stand for one minute and the pulse and blood pressure are rechecked. Variations include also measuring vitals with the patient sitting in between lying and standing. Historically, examiners might also have waited between two and five minutes between the position change and the pressure measurement. However, a recent robust study of over 11,000 people found that orthostatic hypotension, identified at one minute or more quickly, was more associated with syncope, falls, and death as compared to longer intervals. Orthostatic hypotension is said to be present if the systolic blood pressure drops by at least 20 millimeters of mercury or the diastolic pressure drops by at least 10 between lying and standing. The heart rate may or may not increase, but this is neither necessary nor sufficient to be labeled as having orthostatic hypotension. If the patient's heart rate increases by 30 beats or more without a concurrent drop in blood pressure, that's suggestive of a condition called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or POTS. And if the patient becomes lightheaded upon standing, but has neither significant blood pressure or heart rate changes, we sometimes say that the patient is orthostatic, but it would be a misnomer to label them as having orthostatic hypotension. There are many etiologies of orthostatic hypotension. The most clinically relevant include age-related baroreceptor dysfunction, Parkinson's disease, diabetic autonomic neuropathy, adrenal insufficiency, and medication side effect. Drugs with the highest risk include alpha blockers, beta blockers, and tricyclic antidepressants. Regarding the evidence behind this maneuver, it doesn't really make sense to discuss the positive and negative likelihood ratios for detecting the orthostatic hypotension phenomenon since the physical exam finding is its literal definition. However, there is an important point to make about the evidence here. Historically, orthostatic hypotension has also been used to detect volume depletion in a variety of different clinical scenarios. But studies designed to measure the sensitivity and specificity of this have failed to find it helpful. This surprises a lot of people since it's still part of common teaching and common practice. But once again, despite common belief to the contrary, orthostatic vitals have not yet been shown to be helpful in identifying or ruling out volume depletion. Although orthostatic hypotension may not be helpful for identifying hypovolemia, there are a few signs which are. One of those is called capillary refill time. This is determined by compressing the nail bed of the patient's middle finger or adjacent fingers for five seconds and then timing how long it takes to regain its normal color. At a normal room temperature, the upper limit of normal for children and adult men is two seconds, for adult women is three seconds, and for the elderly is four seconds. A delay over normal is considered suggestive of hypovolemia, though it can also be seen in other states of low cardiac output, 
including heart failure. Poor skin turgor is a finding elicited by pinching the skin and seeing how long it takes for the skin to return to its normal position. This is most often performed on the back of the hand, though one study suggested greater accuracy if performed on the thigh or subclavicular area. Prolonged tenting of the skin is suggestive specifically of hypovolemia and is not characteristic of heart failure. Dry oral mucosa has been found to be a helpful sign of hypovolemia, though in my opinion it seems particularly subjective. A lack of axillary moisture is sometimes also cited as a sign of hypovolemia, but the studies that have demonstrated value in this sign included one that used a skin moisture impedance meter and another that involved applying a pre-weighted tissue paper to the axilla for 15 minutes, which was then reweighed to see how much water had been absorbed. So these are hardly practical maneuvers. One final test of hypovolemia is the passive leg raise. There is more than one variation to this. I'll discuss the variation that I think has the best evidence for non-intubated patients. The patient starts with their torso elevated at 30 to 45 degrees for five minutes, after which the blood pressure is measured and the pulse pressure is calculated as the systolic pressure minus the diastolic. Then the patient's torso is lowered to the horizontal while their legs are elevated to 30 to 45 degrees for five minutes, after which the pulse pressure is determined again. This maneuver is only practical if the bed or exam table is able to support the elevated legs. What's happening here is the blood that is passively collected in the veins of the legs due to gravity is being abruptly returned to the heart, transiently mimicking the effect of a 500 cc bolus of intravenous fluid. Since preload is one determinant of cardiac output and the pulse pressure is a surrogate of cardiac output, if the pulse pressure increases above a certain threshold, in this case an increase of at least 9%, it suggests the patient was on the so-called steep part of the heart's starling curve, which relates contractility as a function of preload. Notably, in practice, the passive leg raise maneuver is more thought of as a way to determine if a patient with hypotension will be fluid responsive, more than it is used as a specific diagnostic test for hypovolemia. In other words, hypovolemia and fluid responsiveness aren't the exact same thing, though it is a subtle distinction. There are two findings that are specific to heart failure. The first of these is the proportional pulse pressure. This is just a calculation based on the blood pressure. It equals the pulse pressure divided by the systolic pressure. So for example, if the blood pressure was 150 over 100, the proportional pulse pressure would be 50 divided by 150, or 33%, versus a blood pressure of 100 over 80, in which it would be 20 divided by 100, or 20%. Anything less than 25% is considered abnormal. Among patients with known heart failure, portional pulse pressure is helpful for both ruling in and ruling out an unusually low cardiac index of 2.2 liters per minute per meter squared. The second finding is abdominal jugular reflux. This is an abnormality observed in the JVP in which sustained external pressure applied to the abdomen leads to a sustained increase in the JVP. The examiner presses either in the right upper quadrant or peri-umbilical region for at least 10 seconds, and according to one paper for 15 seconds, while observing the JVP. A positive test is considered to be either a rise of three centimeters during the application of pressure, or an immediate drop of at least four centimeters once pressure is released the JVP may briefly rise a few centimeters in healthy people, which is actually a helpful way to identify the JVP to begin with, but it normally should come back down after a few cardiac cycles. Thus, the sustained aspect of the maneuver is important. The mechanism of this finding is that increased abdominal pressure squeezes blood out of the splanchnic veins, driving this blood back to the right side of the heart, but if the right heart is failing, this additional volume cannot be accommodated without a significant increase in the central venous pressure. Among patients presenting to the emergency room with dyspnea, the presence of abdominal jugular reflux significantly increases the likelihood that heart failure is the underlying diagnosis, though to what extent this finding is independent of a conventionally elevated JVP 
is unknown. Cardiac tamponade, or just tamponade for short, is a condition in which fluid has not only accumulated in the pericardial space, but it has done so either quickly enough or has enough volume as to impair diastolic filling, leading to decreased cardiac output, hypotension, dyspnea, and frequently death. So although rare, it's a critical problem to identify and identify quickly. Cardiac tamponade is sometimes associated with something called Beck's triad, which is the combination of hypotension, elevated JVP, and soft heart sounds. However, notably, Dr. Beck was a thoracic surgeon who was describing what could be referred to as surgical tamponade, that is tamponade due to trauma, aortic dissection, or myocardial rupture in the setting of an acute MI. Tamponade can also be so-called medical tamponade, caused by malignant pericardial effusions or pericarditis, including tuberculosis. In this case, Beck's triad is typically not seen, and instead the typical triad, which doesn't actually have an eponym, is tachycardia, elevated JVP, and something called a pulsus paradoxus, which is what I'll be talking about for the next few minutes. The term pulsus paradoxus is a frustrating misnomer because there is nothing paradoxical about it. It's only an exaggeration of the normal decrease in blood pressure that occurs during inspiration. When a person inhales, the diaphragm descends, creating negative interthoracic pressure. This negative pressure is what generates the pressure gradient that, uh, with the outside air that draws in the breath. The negative pressure also increases venous return to the right side of the heart, which causes a relative leftward displacement of the interventricular septum. That negative pressure also decreases the pressure gradient, driving pulmonary blood back to the left side of the heart. The decreased LV preload and the leftward movement of the septum have a combined effect of decreasing the LV stroke volume and thus momentarily decreasing blood pressure to a small degree that is often overlooked. Let's see how to observe this first in a healthy individual, and then we can see what happens to a person with tamponade. The position of the patient likely doesn't matter, but do not give them any specific instruction on their breathing. You want the patient to continue their default breathing pattern. Wrap a manual blood pressure cuff around their arm just as you were taking a conventional manual blood pressure. This maneuver cannot be performed with an automated cuff. Then inflate the cuff just as you normally would, but as you deflate it, do so very slowly. At some point, you will start to hear the cord cough sounds, but only intermittently, during expiration only. Make note of the pressure when this happens. Then continue to deflate the cuff until the cord cough sounds are heard throughout the entire respiratory cycle. And make note of that pressure. The difference between those two pressures is referred to as the pulsus. Although it's not strictly necessary for the maneuver, if you were to continue to deflate the cuff, the cord cuff sounds will disappear at the diastolic blood pressure. In this particular example, the blood pressure is 130 over 90, with a pulsus of 8, which is borderline hypertensive, but otherwise normal. And although it's not specifically a sign of tamponade per se, the proportional pulse pressure is 130 minus 90 divided by 130, which is 31% and also normal. How is the maneuver and finding different for a patient with tamponade? In this case, as we allow the cuff to very slowly deflate, there is a much larger range over which the cord cough sounds are intermittent, initially being present only during expiration when intrathoracic pressure is relatively high. In this example, the blood pressure is 110 over 85 with a pulses of 18. In addition to the presence of pulses paradoxus, note the additional finding of low proportional pulse pressure. In this case, it's 110 minus 85 divided by 110, which is 23%, indicating probable low cardiac output. So even though the systolic blood pressure of 110 may not initially seem concerning, the abnormal pulses and a low proportional pulse pressure, if that was all you knew about this patient, you would speculate that the patient is likely critically ill. Now, it's a common misconception 
that the accumulation of fluid in the pericardial space is the only pathology that can lead to pulsus paradoxus. Actually, any disease that causes wide swings in intrathoracic pressure can do the same. That's right, although tamponade is the most classic etiology of pulsus paradoxus, it's not the only one. It can also be seen in massive pulmonary embolism, obesity, and exacerbations of asthma and COPD. Most references cite the normal range for the pulses as 10 or less millimeters of mercury, while one review found that using a cutoff of 12 or less improved the positive likelihood ratio without worsening the negative likelihood ratio. To emphasize, a negative likelihood ratio of 0.03 is incredibly powerful. For example, if a patient with a known pericardial effusion had an estimated pretest probability of tamponade of 25%, yet they had a normal pulses, their post-test probability would be only 1%. Now, for viewers who have already seen a number of the videos in this series, including some of the ones on archaic, outdated maneuvers, you might wonder, if someone is suspected of tamponade, aren't you going to get an echocardiogram anyway? Why is this different than assessing the PMI or apical impulse, which I think is something which physical exam training should no longer routinely include? Well, the difference comes down to a combination of two things. First, there is a pervasive myth that a lack of hypotension makes tamponade unlikely, despite the observation that the majority of patients with medical tamponade are not, frankly, hypotensive at initial presentation. The second thing, tamponade is a medical emergency. If concern for it comes up at 1 in the morning, the patient needs an echo at 1 in the morning not seven hours later when the hospital's echo lab opens. A classic scenario I've seen play out more than once is when a medical team is worried about tamponade after hours, and they page the on-call cardiologist for a stat echo, who then states something erroneous like, the patient can't have tamponade, they're not hypotensive. And then that cardiologist refuses to come to the hospital to do the study emergently. However, if you then respond, but this patient has a pulses of 25, the cardiologist absolutely cannot argue with that. That concludes this video on specialized maneuvers within the cardiovascular exam. I'd like to thank Radica for helping me out today. Be sure to check out the rest of this ongoing series.